guidance with respect to providing information to the community about COVID-19. And um, today we want to listen to different stories about how many people have lived through the tragedy of this pandemic. And we have a very dynamic panel of experts and community leaders. And so without any further delay, I'm going to turn it over to our Deputy Director Cheryl Sharp and Attorney Michelle dumas Kular, who have arranged um, and coordinated this webinar. And thank you all for joining us. Good morning to everyone and thank you to the, the panelists and thank you to our consultant, Dr. Cato Lawrenson. Um, this is an unprecedented year, um, but we are excited to share this information and to record this information for use in future trainings. Um, so that many, many people will uh, be privy to the information that comes out here today. We want to thank HUD. This webinar and this webinar series is possible through a, by, uh, because of a grant uh, that we received from HUD, uh, which is Housing and Urban Development, um, to talk about housing issues and how where you live affects health care outcomes, mortality, morbidity, uh, rates. We've already explored some of those issues in previous webinars and we're going to continue the discussion and now hear some of the stories of, of people um, dealing with the pandemic, how it's affected them, how it affects disproportionately uh, certain individuals um, in the health care system. And so we are excited and look forward to the presentation and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle now because um, she has the order of presentation. Uh, I do. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, before we get to the speakers, I just wanted to let you all know that the commission has been offering these webinars really um, since the start of the pandemic. Um, well, the start of us not being in the office due to the pandemic, which was last March. We're closing in on a year, a sad year. Um, that information we've really tried to conveniently locate on our website. So. Um, I'm going to type in the chat very shortly our website um, and where the information is located. Um, the other thing that is really important is for us to make sure that we continue to serve all of you when you have questions that come up or, or needs that come up well after this webinar. So I'm also going to put in information on how to email us and how to telephone us directly, real humans and people um, who will respond to you. Um, once this webinar is over, we will take questions during this webinar of our esteemed panel, um, but we will continue to take your questions and answer your questions um, and hopefully guide you in the right direction after this webinar is over. So please check out the chat in a few minutes um, and I will put um, information in it so that you can continue to stay in touch with the commission. The commission continues to run and we've always have during this whole time but we wanna make sure that we're as connected to all of you as possible. Um, we have an incredible panel of, of, of speakers this morning who come both from the faith community and the healthcare community to provide information um, about the healthcare community, um, people who are being served um, on all levels and really um, you know, the despair that we see. Um, it's really something that, again, we're trying to address uh, with HUD through the housing component of it, but it affects all aspects of, of how we live. We can't just uh, isolate it to our housing. So our first speaker, um, who Cheryl's going to introduce, is Dr. Laurentian. He's going to speak about the research that he's doing um, and also share a video with us. So Dr. Cato Lawrenson is with uh, UConn Health and we are excited to have him here now for the third time to conclude our web series on health equity and housing. Uh, Dr. Lawrenson has a um, arm length long uh, uh, bio, um, but every webinar we just have him tell you about himself because he does a better job of it than I think we can. So we're gonna continue on with that tradition. Um, <laughs> And Dr. Lorenzen, if you are queued up and ready, thank you so much for all of your insight. The commission as a result of the health equity uh, webinar series has developed a public service announcement, two of them actually. We have storyboards for two, which we will be uh, filming in March. And so we thank 
all of those who have contributed to that effort, and certainly Dr. Lawrenson, you're one of the uh, premier uh, contributors um, based on the research that you provided. So without further ado, Dr. Lawrenson. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. And it's uh, wonderful to be here. Um, um, you know, it's uh, I had to uh, you know, wade through and get through Microsoft Teams to get here. I felt like I needed a third doctorate degree <laughs> in order to be able to to do this. But I am here and I'm very happy to uh, be here. I think a couple of my other colleagues are, are trying to make sure that they get in and I, I completely empathize with them. I'm going to try to share my screen now uh, as the next step here. I'm opening up my shared tray. Um, and I'm I see I have to go to my computer. Ah, uh -huh, here it is. Think something's happening. Ah, there we go. Can everyone see? Mm -hmm. Yes. Everyone, yes. Yes. Thank go ahead. Awesome. All right. Well, let, let me uh, again uh, thank everyone for inviting me. Uh, this has uh, been a great series, and it's been uh, great to uh, to be a part of it. Um, I'll be presenting, um, really talking about a number of issues involving uh, health equity uh, in my uh, in my presentation today. Um, um, as was said before, I am uh, Dr. Kayla Lorenzen. I'm uh, the uh, university professor, one of two at the University of Connecticut in the Van Dusen Distinguished Professor of Orthopedic Surgery, and I run the Connecticut Convergence Institute for Translation in Regenerative Engineering at the University of Connecticut, which is really involved with a whole host of uh, work and technologies from uh, our project to engineer an entire limb by 2030 called the Hartford Engineering a Limb Project to a number of community programs, including the Justice Moving Program, low-level exercise contributing to the health and welfare of people in um, Black and Latino uh, individuals in the communities of Hartford. Um, the other part of, uh, another part of my life is that I'm a core faculty member at the Africana Studies Institute at the uh, University of Connecticut, and I'm the editor of the Journal of Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities, which is our uh, probably the number one journal in the country in health disparities and co-founded the W. Mike Cobb NMA Health Institute, which is a health institute dedicated to the issues of black people in America. Um, and so my disclosures, I'm, uh, I've been a consultant uh, for uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, in some of their vaccine work. Uh, and also uh, I'm on the board of directors of a company called uh, uh, MyMedics. So my focus uh, today will be mainly on uh, vaccines and the uh, in the black community, uh, and uh, which is what I want to talk about. Um, what I would like to do is I'll talk about, I'll describe my, and the whole goal for me is hopefully to provide some answers for people who may be listening in the community, provide answers to where people who are training the trainers uh, in terms of uh, talking to people in the uh, black community. I'll describe my personal experience uh, and then I'll discuss um, answers to questions uh, from that I gave in a, in a video of the uh, National Academy's Roundtable on Black Men and Black Women, Science, Engineering, and Medicine had an hour and a half long video uh, on answering questions. And uh, there's a panel of five of us, and I'll, I'll, I'll provide the answers that I gave for, you know, in, in my portion of, the, uh, of that the video. Um, we, I'll discuss answers to questions after a New York Times op-ed. There were uh, 60 members of the National Academy of Medicine, black members of the National Academy of Medicine, which clearly I think represent the majority of, of black people in the elected to the National Academy of Medicine, produced a New York Times op-ed last week um, about vaccine hesitancy and addressing issues regarding uh, 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 blacks receiving the vaccine. And, and I was... Uh, Honored to be able to participate in that, and, um, and there was a follow-up uh, with some questions to me. I had an interview with NBC TV, NBC Connecticut last week, um, 
which um, uh, which I'll I'll you go over some of the main points in terms of what I spoke in terms of what I said to them about about vaccines and the state of Connecticut, and also an interview with CBS TV uh, um, WFSB uh, that was I think last Thursday or Friday, uh, just very very timely these last few days um, that I'll review some of the key um, the key uh, key areas that I talked about. Um, well, you know, what, what do we, uh, you know, what do we know, and we about uh, in terms of where we are with COVID nineteen? Um, well, as you know, we wrote the first paper on COVID nineteen and black people. Actually, the first paper in the country, and with the with referee uh, liter in the referee literature with real data on COVID nineteen and black people, showing the high high rates of um, of cases and high rates of deaths in blacks with COVID nineteen, and uh, and we're seeing the effects of COVID nineteen. Um, uh, after 2020 are, are huge. This is uh, data on life expectancy uh, for um, in terms of um, uh, for 2020 in terms of COVID-19. What one can see is that life expectancy uh, fell one year, uh, fell by one year in the first half of 2020. In other words, the average life expectancy that took place in terms of for COVID-19 fell by one year uh, in uh, for for you know, total is also for females and males uh, in 2019 and 2020. But if you um, and the, the death data is high, if you look at the numbers of deaths, we're still at this, you know, big peak area right now. We thought the big surge was in April, uh, but we're still, you know, way ahead of uh, way higher than the highest numbers that we saw in the last um, surge of and uh, the big surge that we talked about taking place in April. But in terms of black people, the, the um, I want to I want to let everyone know this and, and, and see see these data that black males lost three years of life in six months. Black men lost three years of life expectancy in a matter of six months in terms of the numbers of deaths that are taking place. And so while yes, the total number may be a year. That year is made up, you know, the is the brunt of that year of uh, loss of life expectancy across the country is made up by black men and also black women. But black men losing three years as opposed to um, um, uh, white females losing a half a year. Um, and it really points to what's going on in terms of the, the big uh, brunt that's taking place in the black community in terms of uh, COVID in terms of COVID-19. Um, I'm going to try to you know, have this video play. I hope it does. And uh, let me know that you can hear it. And it will, because I, what I, I wanted to, to talk to people about the COVID-19 vaccine, and, but I also wanted to discuss my, uh, my journey in terms of the COVID-19 vaccine and, and uh, to provide information, hopefully, uh, for people who are thinking about uh, getting the vaccine. Let me know you can hear. Can you hear it? No, the video is up, but it's not playing. I don't know if you just have to. Can you hear it on your end? Yeah, very well, so. Okay, just there's also, if you look down at your share tray up on the upper left-hand side, there is a a switch in order to allow the audio to um, be heard by everybody that your computer audio. Do you see that? I'm sorry, where is it? If you look at the share tray, it's on the upper left hand side of the share tray. It looks like a switch that goes from left to right. It's in it. I believe it says share computer audio. OK, I will. OK, I'm looking. Uh, it, says include, uh, it says include computer sound is what it says on the upper left hand side. Upper left hand side of my screen or? Of the share tray. So when you look down into the share tray, when you shared your screen. Okay. Open, okay, I'm opening the share tray. Yep. And on the upper, on the left hand side of the share tray, it says include computer sound. And it says PowerPoint browse. Um, it should be about halfway down on your screen. I don't have anything. Could you? Um, actually, I can share my. Um, if I can. We can't both share at the same time. 
All right. The other thing I can do is I can, you know, this is a little bit, you know, I can browse and I can go right to the video itself. Yes, because the video wasn't, the video appeared on our screen, but wasn't actually playing. All right. That don't they doesn't fi, doesn't support uh, the file. All right, so let's go with. Um, so I'm give me one more try of this, so or we'll just move on. But if you're, I'm looking at. I I have a tray here. Right, and then if when you open up the share tray, which allows you to to share your um, slides right now, it'll there's a little switch at the top of where your slides would be located and it says include computer sound. And you have to switch it over so that the computer sound plays. Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm looking at the I'm, I'm pre are you seeing me press this button here? Uh, I do not. All right, and I'm looking for oh, there. You go. OK, so I think that's happening now. It highlighted red now. All right, and so I can do that, but you're saying there's a tray for me that maybe I, after I started up, I didn't see it. I'm not sure. And it may be that if you turn it up on your computer, the audio on your computer will be able to pick up with our PowerPoint sure. with, our, with the webinar. How was that? For some reason, it's not. All right, I'll, I will. I will move on. Okay, I'm going to. Can you hear me? Okay. Can anyone hear me? Actually, if you go back to it, I was able to play it for some reason on my side. So if you go back to that slide, I believe I can play it. The slide that had your video in it. Okay. I don't know why that happened. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> to right, say there, you right, go. Let's, there we go i believe everybody can hear it spencer can you hear that uh i can't but if i press play i can get it to play oh so is, you can play it on your end i think everyone can which is a whole okay. new thing okay Yeah. If everyone can play it on their end, you'll be able to hear it. So that uh, that's an option, Michelle. That uh, yes, one you can play it on your press screen. play on your screen all at yeah, the same I time. We'll say that. your mark is ready, go, and then hit play, <laughs> and then we'll take it from there. So, <laughs> is everyone ready? On your mark, get set, play. Had a terrible and long-lasting impact <laughs> on the world. <clears throat> Okay, that was interesting. Let, it was very interesting. We've never had that happen before, but. Let me move on. <laughs> okay, go right ahead. <laughs> so I'm going to um, move on. So this video was conducted by the Roundtable Leadership. Um, uh, there's a, another video called on the black community and the COVID-19 vaccine, um, which is and it was called uh, discussing 
the um, the justified questions. And that video is on the National Academy of Science website. <clears throat> and I will uh, share that video with um, the video link uh, with the uh, with CHRO uh, because it also includes that video. And believe me, it's a very very nice video about my experiences <laughs> on the um, getting the uh, vaccine, getting the vaccine. Um, but also has a question and a question and answer period, <clears throat> which is a very important question and answer period, which talks about some of the questions that are facing the uh, facing the uh, the community, the black community right now in terms of um, um, uh, in terms of the um, in terms of the in, in terms of the uh, the um, um, the vaccine. What I'd like to do is to go over some of the questions that I answered in terms of the vaccine. Um, and uh, that are, I think, you know, questions that the black community is asking. <clears throat> first, <clears throat> the first question is, can the vaccine, excuse me, <clears throat> can the vaccine alter my own DNA? Uh, can the vaccine alter my fertility? And can someone get COVID-19 from the vaccine itself? And the answer is, is no, the vaccines don't work that way. Um, and some have asked me, and a couple of patients have asked me, can I get COVID-19 from the vaccine itself? And that answer is no, because the vaccine doesn't work that way. The question is, can the vaccine alter my fertility? And there are some groups, including the Nation of Islam, that is actually that's actually suggested that there may be some alteration of fertility due to the vaccine. The answer is, at least as far as we know, no. Um, the clinical trials found no difference in fertility with people who got the vaccine and those who got a placebo. And so as far as we know from the information from clinical trials and the follow-up that we've had so far, um, these are rumors and we can dispel them uh, in, our, in our community. Um, uh, and then the, the one other question was, what's the most reliable COVID-19 vaccine information website? And what I said was that the CDC website is a great source of information. And um, I actually start, saw a study, and it was done by the Pew Foundation, which spoke to the fact that black people are actually very adherent to a number of the guidelines set forth by the CDC. Uh, and that blacks look at these guidelines, they adhere to the guidelines, and they actually adhere to the guidelines to a greater extent than white do. Um, and so, uh, which means that the questions about whether to get the vaccine or not are, are not coming from um, uh, 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 are not coming from a lack of knowledge. It's because they're questions, and that black people are intelligent about these issues. They hear the guidelines. They're curious about the facts. Curious about the data, um, and the, the questions reflect a high level of understanding of these issues, and not a low level of understanding. Uh, of these uh, of these issues, and so um, um, next question is how long will the vaccine effects last? And as I've said to people, this isn't your average virus here. And when we think about the seasonal flu, there's a seasonal flu virus, and I think the COVID-19 virus is going to be three to 365 days a year virus. I said that in the very very beginning, and that's what we're finding out. And I think that someone else in the beginning said that during the summer it's just all going to go away. And uh, no, this is a 365 day virus and we're already seeing a number of variants that are taking place inside the seas inside, inside the, the virus, you know, 365. Obviously, we, you know, I do believe that we'll probably need, I'm maybe one of the first states, we'll need a booster or some sort of a booster on the vaccine on a yearly basis, because again, it's not your average virus that we're facing. And we'll need to combat it. But it's important that we get ahead of this in the black community. And I want to make it very, very clear. You know, we've written at our institute about HIV in the black community. We and I'm make sure we don't forget about HIV in the, in the black community because it's a it's a real scourge and problem. And also the fact is that we have some treatments that that may be effective in terms of helping the black community. Um, but we've seen the situation before. And as I said, we've been there. We've done that. We got the T-shirt in terms of HIV. We're now 45% of individuals with the virus are from the black community each year. There's the new infections and also, you know, also the prevalence right now. And so we have to make sure we get ahead of this because we don't want this to become something that's centered in the black community in terms of the future as, as HIV is right now. Um, the next question was, what safety measures can people take for those who choose not to be vaccinated? 
Um, and if someone decides not to get vaccinated for any reason, they have to double down on the things, washing their hands, wearing a mask, and socially distancing. And they have to not associate with people who are not going to adhere. Uh, and I think that um, uh, also it's important that people are physically fit and become as physically fit as possible. Um, the, um, and that means that the person has to um, have the best nutrition, you know, stop smoking, because we know that damage can take place with COVID-19 in the lungs. Uh, and basically do the things you, that the doctor has been telling you to do you haven't done in the past. <laughs> um, and you've got to double down on in keeping yourself as, hot, as healthy as possible in terms of moving forward. Uh, now, what are the range of COVID-19 available right now? Well, the two right now in the U.S. are Pfizer and Moderna. And they're based on something called mRNA technology. And basically, the mRNA is a, is a segment um, that's wrapped in a nanoparticle. I like that because we work on nanoparticles. And it's made of a fat or lipid. And it, it's then taken up by the cells. And the cells actually start making, the, making proteins. Um, and these proteins are actually recognized as part of the virus. But it's not the virus itself. So it's a great technology in which you are, one has the, the, the virus proteins, but you don't have the virus at all. And the vaccine builds the immune response. And the body, as I've said before, the body sees these protein particles. And for the first time, it says, my goodness, you know, let, let's attack it. Uh, and the body then attacks it on its own terms. Um, it, you know, and with the, it doesn't attack it with a lot of virus particles replicating and doing damage. It does so in its own terms, and then it creates muscle memory, as we call it, uh, as a sports in sports. I'm also a sports medicine doctor. Um, where where if it comes again, it says you know it, it's already seen it. It says okay, we're waiting for the next time it comes, and it can take it if you get an actual um, you know COVID-19 infection. Now, how effective are the vaccines? And the Pfizer. Um, vaccine and the Moderna vaccines have about 95% effectiveness. And uh, um, and a 95% level is a very, very confident level. And in fact, in the other, uh, another webinar I was in, um, uh, I saw data that was uh, presented about the Pfizer vaccine. And the clinical trial that took place with the Pfizer vaccine had a, a good number of, of black people in it. And while the overall effectiveness was 95%, um, it was 100% in the clinical trial for the black people in the trial. So often we have, you know, we have studies and trials and we don't have uh, in, you know, adequate data on how it affects black people. But we found that 100% in this Pfizer trial, 100% of black people in that particular trial, um, uh, it was 100% effective. Uh, I think the 95% level is probably a pretty good number for the black community in terms of, uh, in terms of thinking about it. Uh, the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, Johnson Johnson vaccines are coming out. It's not 100% clear, 100 clear what the efficacy level is. The Johnson Johnson vaccine is a single shot, and it may need a booster by the time it finally comes out. But it's uh, but they're they're coming too. Um, and what does it cost to get vaccinated? Uh, people ask me that, and what I I it's in, uh, one of the things. Um, and if you look at data from Pew and Kaiser, etc., these are some of the top questions in terms of can I afford it and right now it's right now at least right now this year it's free 100 percent free um, and um, uh, and then the question is uh, so that's a very very important that's absolutely free right now um, do I have a choice to in terms of which vaccine you you, you, know, you receive and I, as I said in the beginning I as a disclaimer I'm a consultant for Johnson Johnson um, and the fact the Pfizer vaccine came out and I said, well, OK, what's the vaccine? The Pfizer said, I said, OK, fine, I'm going to get the Pfizer vaccine. <laughs> and so um, that is to underscore the fact that uh, that when you get what when it's anything that's available, get in line and get what's available. And, and, and it's not this is not a time to be choosy about what type of vaccine that you get. At the University of Connecticut, I was one of the first to, to get it and at our institution. The first week, the Pfizer vaccine was available. And the second week, the Moderna vaccine was available. I came, I came to the first week, so I got the Pfizer vaccine. And so I think the key thing is, um, at this point, I wouldn't be uh, particular about which vaccine you get. It's just important to, to get it. Um, and then the, the question is, what is the hope that there will be a prior, prioritization for vac vaccination that takes into account the massively increased risk by race? 
Um, and I think that um, that my answer has always been, I think we have to get down to basics in terms of our community, in terms of encouraging black people to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And um, this is a, a few weeks ago, I, I said I've seen data that among, even among health professionals and people who are eligible who are black, that there's a lower percentage. Um, and um, and I know there are a number of people com commented that, that black people should come first because of our higher rates. And at the same time, um, uh, uh, you know, I think we're not that you know, we're not. I don't really want to get into that debate. I think that we're at the point right now. First of all, I think that if if but we told a lot of black people you know come first, they'd say, oh, you want us to go first? Okay, well maybe you should go first <laughs> on this. Um, so I think that making sure that everyone has access. Uh, looking at you know vulnerable areas and vulnerable populations and, and placing an emphasis because we know that those popular those areas tend not to get the attention that um, that other areas get so paying attention to that is important um, but I think the, the the bottom line will be getting uh, the, the uh, you know questions that black people have discussed and making sure there's a comfort level in terms of getting the vaccine is going to be in the end will be the critical factor. Now, people have asked me about medical mistrust in the black uh, community. And, um, and again, we created this um, this round table of black men and black women in science, engineering and medicine at the National Academy. You can if you, you can look up keywords round table, black men, black women, and you can get the find out about the uh, the round table. I am the uh, founding chair of the round table on black men and black women in science, engineering and medicine. Um, and um, and we we've, we've looked at a lot of these different uh, th these different issues, and we have to recognize um, that one of the big problems is because of racism and discrimination in America, we just don't have a lot of black doctors in America, and especially we don't have black male doctors, which are very 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 low. Uh, so we have to have a, acknowledge that, and because of that, we get less trustworthiness in the system. Um, and besides that, we also know that in a number of uh, studies, black physicians are more likely to treat black patients and administer care. And we need black physicians in the black community. And we need to look at our trusted sources in the black community who are physicians. And we need to rely on trusted sources in terms of trusted voices in terms of the black physicians who are in the community to talk to our, uh, our patients. Now, I just had a New York, uh, again, the New York Times had 60 black health experts urging black Americans to uh, become vaccinated. Um, and um, I, uh, in a follow up piece uh, that was done, uh, there was a uh, there were questions to me regarding uh, by Yukon Health regarding um, uh, blacks. Uh, and the first question was, are blacks contracting the COVID-19 virus at higher rates? And he wrote the first paper on COVID-19 in the black community, a call to action, which really uh, spoke to the fact that that blacks were, were getting COVID-19 and dying of COVID-19 at, at higher rates. And now we see this, this data repeated across the country in terms of different um, different areas. And again, it makes it even more important that black people become uh, vaccinated. The other question was how may racism in the healthcare system influence medical mistrust? Um, and we call racism in, in the healthcare system in a number of different ways, Un conscious bias, unconscious bias, stereotyping, prejudice, we know contributes to the healthcare disparities we see right now and the high rates of morbidity and deaths among the black you know, population. And it's a driver of mistrust. And and, um, um, and we've talked about the fact, again, that we wrote a book, An American Crisis, for the absence of black men in medicine, which also, again, speaks to the fact that we've got, you know, we've got these issues that are taking place that we need to address in terms of medicine. And, and, and a lot of it's also in terms of workforce. Um, so how do we address medical mistrust right now and urge the black community to get um, uh, get uh, be vaccinated? Well, first of all, what we're doing right now is very, very important uh, in terms of uh, the this this webinar to talk to people about um, about uh, uh, medical mistrust. And I use the term justified medical mistrust in terms of the black community and um, and to uh, answer questions that, that are that are taking place in terms of this area. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, we need to develop trustworthiness in medicine for blacks in Connecticut and also the country. One way that we're doing that is that we're re relaunching the Emotep Connecticut National Medical Association Society. This is the society of, for, of, um, of uh, an affinity group society of black doctors in the, in the state of Connecticut. It's been largely dormant over the last few years. Um, um, I'm now the new president of that society. 
and uh, and we've um, uh, I'm gratified to see that the major health systems in the state of Connecticut uh, are supporting our relaunch and supporting you know, the, the creation of this group that is really trying to encourage uh, um, a, a better ecosystem uh, for um, for black doctors in the state of Connecticut. Um, uh, now let me just close with just a few slides in terms of what we know in terms of the department in terms of Connecticut with DPH. Uh, as you may know that uh, on the 10th, uh, the DPH released its uh, available race and ethnicity uh, uh, data uh, that really showed um, low levels of, of blacks being vaccinated in, in the uh, across in terms of the state of Connecticut. Um, and uh, and and also noted that that uh, the that again, as we saw before, with rate, with acknowledgments of rates of uh, of COVID nineteen cases, uh, that fifty percent of data provided by vaccine providers across the country does not uh, uh, contain race and ethnicity data, which I think is um, uh, is is absolutely terrible. Um, and um, um, uh, I did have a conversation with the uh, with the commissioner. Uh, I think on Friday uh, about where we are and expressed my concerns about where we are and where we're going. Um, I did like the fact that she um, uh, it, it appears very, very cognizant of some of the issues uh, and has, has stated that they'll redouble their efforts in terms of being able to um, allocating um, uh, 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 allocating uh, to the black and Latino communities uh and uh you know encouraging uh, vaccine providers to conduct outreach and implement others uh, that will help the underserved and, and so i was yeah, I, I was very happy to see her responsiveness in terms of you know, in terms of my questions and concerns again blacks are getting vaccinated at lower rates in connecticut by the early data um uh and uh you know with three to thirty three thousand uh, doses administered only 3.4 percent are black 5.2% are uh, are uh, Hispanic, and so these numbers are uh, low, especially in community. Especially considering that this is a community that is, uh, has been the hardest hit. Uh, just, I had a couple of uh, appearances at last week in NBC Connecticut, um, uh, and talked about the fact that there's vaccine hesitancy. And again, the answer is, is to build trust with the Black community, with trusted sources like trusted physicians. Um, those from churches, those from other other trusted areas to be able to talk about this. And again, um, and while people don't trust the system because it, and it's historical, you know, there's a public health service study, service study of black men in Tuskegee. Um, but this has continued even today in terms of our in terms of the medical system, in terms of uh, in terms of what uh, uh, what people what what uh, what people see. Um, we also need to focus on access to the vaccine. Um, even issues of transportation. How do you get there to, to uh, so so creating areas where people live to be able to get that vaccine is very, very important um, because you have a perfect storm here. You've got the combination of fact that the access is maybe low or it may be difficult in the, it may be difficult to be able to set up your appointment. And at the same time, you're also a little bit hesitant in doing it in the first place. Uh, that combination leads to not getting uh, not getting vaccinated. And so the communities have our communities um, need and deserve having uh, having high access to uh, to uh, vaccines and also uh, and having the vaccines uh, in their community to be able to be obtained. Um, and I talked about this in terms of the vaccination rates of 75 plus people, 75 plus only 1% uh, of the uh, are uh, going to blacks right now. Uh, and again, there is justified medical mistrust in America and we have to do a better job in Connecticut improving the scheduling process. We need to make it user friendly. I, I went to the website and I think that you know, if I've got a, you know, an MD and a PhD, I can manage through the website to get an appointment. If you don't, if you're 75 and you're, you know, and you, you have a flip phone, it's going to be much more difficult to be able to uh, go to a website to be able to uh, to be able to arrange appointments. And so we need to do uh, a better job in terms of uh, in terms of the old, our older population. Again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about this uh, this uh, COVID-19 journey. Uh, we've um, uh, on uh, on my Connecticut Convergence Institute website, there is a link uh, for the COVID-19 video that uh, that we had uh, that we had had up, and you could view it at your leisure, which takes me takes me takes you through 72 hours uh, of uh, 
of my getting uh, the aftermath of my getting the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Again, I, I really want to encourage it for the particularly for the black community. Uh, and I think that we're at a very, very important time in terms of you know moving forward uh, with with helping the black community in terms of uh, in terms of the, the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. Dr. Cato Lawrence, and thank you so much for the information that you provided to us today and for starting this webinar series um, off this morning um, as we explore and discuss where we live and how where we live affects health outcomes. Uh, the stories, the people, the healthcare workers um, that are on the front lines uh, dealing with the situation um, are all uh, subject matter that we uh, should touch upon uh, this morning. And from your presentation, it, it sounds like where you live uh, does matter. So we're looking forward to exploring this issue further. Thank you so much for participating in the previous web series and acting as a consultant uh, with the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities for this web series. Um, and once again, I just want to thank uh, HUD because all of this is possible. Uh, because of a grant that we received from HUD. I am going to turn it over to uh, Michelle Dumaskuler uh, to introduce our next guest. Uh, thank you, Cheryl, and thank you, Dr. Lorenzen. Our next guest is going to be Dr. Harp from the Community Health Center in Bridgeport, which is in a different location, obviously, than when UConn, where UConn Health Center is. Dr. Harp, um, I understand you're an OBGYN, so you come with a, a different perspective. And if you could um, just speak to us a little bit about the work that you're doing in the community that you serve, that would be great. Thank you. Sure, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as was stated, uh, my name is Dajna Harp and I am currently a physician uh, in the role of an obstetrician gynecologist working at Southwest Community Health Center here in Bridgeport. Um, I can speak to you uh, based on my experience. Uh, one, I, I actually had COVID last year. Um, I caught it early. Um, and then also as a clinician, um, I'd just like to thank Dr. Uh, Lawrence for his uh, presentation. Uh, it was very comprehensive. And um, I thought that a lot of really good points were raised. Um, so, you know, as someone who suffered COVID uh, very early on, um, you know, it was definitely an experience that that opened my eyes to some of the limitations uh, that we as people of color actually face in the health system, um, as well as the fact that I, I had caught it so early uh, that people's understanding of, of the virus um, was really just starting to uh, to be born at that at that time. I, I caught it probably mid-March. Um, and, you know, I will say that in terms of uh, vaccine reluctance, I have not seen uh, a lot of vaccine reluctance in my in my practice. Um, I think that there, you know, there's always going to be a cohort that is maybe just not amenable to vaccines, period. But I, I wouldn't say um, that that is across the board by any means. Um, and certainly I work with uh, a number of people here at the health center uh, who were eager to get vaccinated and in fact did get vaccinated um, and have worked with a number of patients, uh, many of who um, have high risk comorbidities who would like to have access to the vaccine, uh, but it hasn't been extended to them yet. Um, so, um, you know, I will say that um, we really it's it's hard to make generalizations across the board. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say that has not necessarily been borne out in the literature and it's still evolving as it relates to uh, just this pandemic in general, what we're starting to see um, on the obstetric side is a lot more high risk pregnancies um, than we've ever seen before, um, a lot more. Um, preeclampsia, uh, which is uh, a disease of pregnancy uh, that's marked by elevated blood pressure, a lot more growth restricted babies. Um, and my sense is, and these are, are people who do not necessarily have 
COVID, um, and many of them have tested negative, but I think that the stress and just the weight of the pandemic we will find has been significantly impactful. And I'll just sort of leave it there and see if anyone has questions for me. Uh, hi, doctor. It's actually Michelle Kuehler again. I had a question about whether you have seen, um, and I'm going to ask this question and we'll move on just because I was really curious because you are in the community. Have you seen where families um, who are living, um, where the, especially um, where you have apartment complexes and people who are living um, in buildings where there's lots of uh, apartments, are you noticing that a lot of people are coming in or that it's spreading more quickly or that that's been kind of, you know, more of an issue, which, you know, we see and that um, living in the city has been its own um, spread problem because of, of of where people are living. And we see it on the housing side. I do a lot of housing work. And that's, a, a, a unfortunately, in Connecticut, a matter of the fact that we don't have enough housing. And so most of the affordable housing happens to be in the city. And um, and a lot of people who live in the city happen to be African American, Hispanic. Who we have a lot of segregation in Connecticut. So I was wondering what you see at the clinic um, in terms of that. Certainly, I mean, I I think it's a very layered discussion. Um, and and I would say on the surface, yes, to your question, uh, yes, that is true. That you know. It, Living within cities, um, the housing structure tends to be much denser. People mm -hmm. are living uh, closer together. Um, so that is certainly true. But I will also say that um, I have a significant number of patients who um, are essential workers who are on the front line, many of them who are, um, you know, um, nursing. Uh, assistance, medical assistance, um, and, and so they have opportunities for exposure, um, not only at their homes, but also with the sort of work that they do. Right, and I, I think we've seen that too, just in um, the cases that we see come through the commission is that it's kind of on both ends. It's not only where they're living, but it's the jobs they're performing too. So thank you for bringing that up. And thank you for um, sharing your experience with actually having COVID and the work that you do. If you could stay on with us for a little bit, that would be great. We're going to take most of the bulk of the questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, the information that you provided. It is really, really telling. Um, next, we are joined by the Honorable Tony Harp. Uh, same last name, a uh, different person. She's the former mayor of the city of New Haven and a former state senator. Uh, she's a dynamic woman, dynamic person. Uh, she uh, also worked as a homeless services uh, director for Hill Health Center um, in a, well, not a previous life, but a while ago. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, we're excited to be joined by uh, the Honorable Tony Howard. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, it's really great to see you again, Ms. Sharp. Uh, I remember you up at the legislature and your advocacy you did and do excellent work. I thought that I would um, speak a little bit about my experience with COVID-19. Um, I actually didn't have it, but I, I think that the way that, or I may have had it and just didn't realize that I had it. And so I thought that I would speak about uh, what it was like to be a retired person going to the gym every day um, and having the people in the gym actually think that uh, to be concerned about COVID-19 would be like being concerned about the flu. And so people really didn't take it seriously. and. I will be honest, I didn't take it seriously until March when my daughter, who you just heard, um, came to me and told me that she didn't feel well, that she couldn't sleep and she couldn't breathe while lying down. And she wanted to get a COVID test at the time, but the only place that you could get an appointment for a COVID test was in Waterbury, which is over 30 miles away from uh, New Haven where we live. And you would think that you would have been able to get one in New Haven, but you couldn't. She managed to get an appointment um, at Waterbury Hospital, but it wasn't easy. Um, 
So she wrapped herself up. We jumped into my car and I drove her to Waterbury. And as soon as I realized um, the problem that she was having breathing at night, I, I'm just going to tell you, I bulked up on my vitamin D3 and probiotics because along with the flu shot, which I was, I got because I was one of those people that really didn't think the flu shots were important until I got deathly sick with it the first year that I worked at the Cornell Scott, well, it was the Hill Health Center at that time. And the head nurse told me, look, fool, uh, you're sick because you didn't get the flu shot. And so uh, I decided that um, I was exposed to my daughter or I may have exposed to her by going to the gym. And I think that one of the things that it's really dangerous about COVID-19 is the fact that it is silent in some people, that you can have it and not know it. And because I'm 73 years old, and because I'm a little overweight uh, beyond uh, what is you're supposed to be for your BMI, um, and I got sick one night, I decided that I was lucky and would absolutely stop going to the gym. Well, in March, as you will recall, even in public, in a community health care centers, staff were not, could not always access PPE. As a matter of fact, I didn't know what PPE was, but uh, I began to know that it played an important role in stemming the spread of this disease. And as a result, um, my daughter and I have a seamstress and we asked her if she would make PPE for our friends and for um, our family members and, and even for some of the people that we know who work in clinics. And so uh, I know that as someone who's supposed to be high functioning, I didn't take this disease seriously until my daughter got sick. And I was really conflicted about whether or not I would get the vaccine because I'd read all these things, there are all these things online. And it occurred to me that um, everyone who was getting the vaccine were either healthcare workers or there were people that I would meet uh, when I would go out who worked in the public and would basically say, I really want to get this vaccine. And those people were people who, who didn't look like me that they were excited about getting it, were very uh, concerned that they weren't in the age cohort to get it. And so that's when I decided I better get this vaccine. So just like my head nurse told me when I worked at the health center, don't be a fool, get the vaccine. Well, then the problem became, how do you get it? I was, uh, that was during the 75 plus when I, that I had that epiphany. And then I learned um, through my, sister-in-law that the Cornell Scott Hill Health Center was having difficulty uh, getting 75 plus people to actually come and get the shot and that they would be starting, they, they projected that 65 plus uh, could be vaccinated that very next week. And so they started taking, um, they started taking appointments. And so I called and, and I was able to make an appointment. And at the time, I didn't pull any strings. I didn't call the executive director. I didn't ask anyone to do anything on my behalf. And it was relatively easy. And then once they started doing the 65 plus, I had said to my friends, Paul, and almost a day or two later, they were not taking appointments. Uh, and they got filled up. And so um, then I, I, I began to wonder, well, what's it like if you can't just directly call and get an appointment? Uh, you have to go online. And one of the things that I recognized is that in New Haven, we have something that is called a digital divide, not just among our elementary uh, and high school students, which now I think that most of them do the governor have access to uh, Chromebooks and access to, to the internet somewhat. But when I think about people my age that uh, may have that uh, phone that isn't so smart, that don't have connection to technology, can't go online, can't uh, 
don't have the ability to call time after time after time for an appointment. Uh, it, it appears to me that these are things that are impediments to access. And so the other thing is that my son is friends with uh, a pharmacist who works in New Haven at one of the CVSs. And when, when the CVSs receive uh, the immunizations or the vaccines, all of those vaccines went to Branford, Guilford, Madison, North Haven, and none of them actually came into New Haven until uh, I believe that they'll be coming into New Haven this week. And so for whatever reason, the system that we've set up to vaccinate people doesn't work for the people who want to be vaccinated, who are people of color. And when I went to get vaccinated at uh, the Cornell Scott Hill Health Center, and I worked there for 27 years, very few white people ever came to our clinic. And I stood in line waiting to get my vaccine and over half of the people there were, were white. They were not from New Haven, but they too somehow had learned of this ability and were there. And I believe that uh, we've got to do everything that we can do to make access to these vaccines, something that people would want, but then once they want them, we've got to make sure that it's easy for them to get them. Right now, it's very difficult. And uh, I've been working with organizations who are working with um, the governor and others to get churches involved and to get others involved. But if it's still difficult, once people have made that decision, then we've got to get a system that is easy to use for certainly our older people, but almost all of our population that has a problem with digital access and make sure that people who want to get this vaccine get it and to try to inspire those who are afraid to overcome their fears and get that vaccine as well. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And I think that things like this will help. Thank you so much. Uh for the information that you provided and for the the, the story, the, the personal story, I, I think it really helps. Um, we, during the first or second, I can't remember at this moment, webinar series uh, talked about um, access. That, mm -hmm. that was one of one of the first topics is, is access to the healthcare. Um, and in this case, in this discussion, access to the vaccine. Um, especially when you have these other uh, looming ideas, right? You have history um, and you have that distrust that's baked in uh, to our history. Um, and we want, wanted to make sure that all communities that we serve have the information regarding uh, the vaccine, um, especially uh, given the, 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 you know, mistrust. Um, because I can even say from a personal standpoint, I, I have some uh, mistrust and I don't know if I'm going to take the vaccine <laughs> or not because of the historical baked in discrimination. And so, um, and, and I'm someone who's also educated and, and I know theoretically that, you know, it should be safe. And, and I hear what Dr. Lawrenson is saying and I hear what you're saying and what other people have said, but it is still something that is looming in my mind and um, certainly uh, looming in the mind of my mother who also is saying she's not going to take the vaccine. So I think we do. We have a lot of work uh, that needs to be done. Uh, and it starts with education because I already feel more comfortable um, having uh, heard some of the information today. And um, and, 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 and while I take the uh, COVID-19 seriously, the way that I'm trying to insulate myself is just never going around anyone. So. Um, but there has to be a better way. And, and so that's why we're really <laughs> thankful uh, for your comments and, and thankful um, thankful uh, that we can have this webinar and, and really appreciate HUD allowing us to look at how where you live affects access, outcomes, mortality, and morbidity rates. And thank you so much. And we will ask you to stay on as well because we are going to take uh, questions. I think we have a couple of more speakers and then we're going to take questions. And once again, I turn it over to Michelle Dimskuehler. 
Thank you so much. Our next speaker is the Reverend Orsella Hughes, who is the pastor of the St. James AME Church in Danbury. And you are going to provide us, hopefully, information um, coming from a completely different perspective. You're in the community as a minister, um, and you, through your church and through religion, are um, meeting people who are um, not coming to you for medical help, but coming to you through their faith. And so um, please ex let us know what you're seeing and um, what you're hearing and what you're saying in response in terms of, you know, the, the especially in Danbury, because you were one of the first areas of the state that was truly devastated by this. Um, and then where you're at now in terms of um, the vaccine and how people are, are um, accepting it or not accepting it and what you're you're doing to work on that. So take it away, Reverend Hughes. Thank you so much, Michelle, and to um, Sister Tanya Hughes, the Commissioner for Human Rights and Opportunities, and for all the panelists um, and the attendees for this morning. Um, I want to make sure my video is on. I'm, I'm new to Teams, so I want to make sure. Yes, okay, I see. Yeah, and, you look and, great. You me? Okay, okay, great. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, you know, I, as I have been recapitulating about where we have been for almost a year, your questions are very timely. Um, last Mar March 15th was our last Sunday in, in last year was our last Sunday in person worship. Um, March 18th was when we received the executive order that all churches uh, would need to, you know, come up with plan B as far as worshiping. Um, and you're right, my church is in Danbury and we were the hardest hit area first. Um, my church is an older congregation, so I had to make decisions based on the age, based on how well, based on, you know, the space of our church and the health of our church. Um, so I made the decision to not even myself worship in the building, but to close the doors, the physical doors of the church, but immediately switch to a virtual platform. We use Zoom. Um, so in the beginning, it just kind of felt like, okay, we're just, we're going to come out of this real soon. And this isn't going to be a long time effect. Um, around the sixth week, that's when our members um, were starting to reach out to me more about, you know, not being connected, um, not, you know, not being around other people and just really feeling um, dis disengaged and detached. Now, that has nothing to do with the fact that, you know, I had been making phone calls and, you know, having Zoom virtual events and opportunities for us to connect, but that fellowship was missed by the members of the church. And then because we were in Danbury, there was absolutely no way we were going to take that risk of um, even attempting to have an event, even with masks or social distancing. So we stayed in that space. But I found um, my I, I found being I found my position being questioned all the time about, you know, where is your faith? If you truly believe that God is God, then uh, where is he in this pandemic and where is he in uh, this isolation? Where is he? So these questions were constantly uh, being asked of me to explain. And, you know, it, it's very clear, you know, in many scriptures in the Bible that you know, we will not always have good days and we are not going to always have days that we can explain or understand or even know the mind of God because we'll never know that. But one thing is for sure, um, having faith does not mean you don't have understanding. And at this time, and you know, at that time, I just had to instill into the membership that this is a time for us to understand our relationship with God and understand our relationships with our families and our friends and, and really, uh, you know, do a self-evaluation of where we are um, during this pandemic. But even then, you know, summertime, I'm thinking we're going to come back into the church and things are going to get normal. Um, but we saw summer come and go. We saw fall come and go. And unlike, you know, some churches, I, I have an older congregation. So putting us back in the building, even when the order uh, was released for us to, um, you know, have up to, I think it was 10% capacity, 
that just wasn't an option for my members because the vaccine had not become, you know, a th- uh, had not become available. I remember speaking with one of my older members. Uh, he's about he's about eighty years old to be exact. And um, when I did my my weekly check in, he said. Rev, as soon as that vaccination is available, I'm getting in line. I said, well, as long as I can get right in the back of you, then we'll go together. Um, so he was in the fir- he was really one of the first people to get the vaccine. Um, but Connecticut did not lift um, clergy to receive the vaccine. So here I found myself where my members were still able to get vaccinated, but I still had to have a virtual connection with them. Um, luckily, because of being connected to individuals who are connected to somebody who knows somebody, um, I, I have since received my first vaccination. Um, it does not mean that I'm going to lift any of the precautions or any uh, of, of, of the CDC requirements, um, but it does mean that um, I, I'll feel more comfortable after my second round with a mask and still washing hands. I will still I will feel more comfortable if they need someone to come and just pray with them. That is a, a, in the black church. That's major to have your pastor come pray for you, come to the hospital and pray with you. Um, and we have lost that connection for a year. Uh, in, in the black church, we have what is called the sick and shut in list. And those are individuals who cannot come, uh, who cannot leave their house and come to the church. So in addition to those who just missed church for a year, we've been disconnected from those who have been sick and shut in even prior to the pandemic, having communion at home. Um, and so now that you know we're we're starting to get more vaccinations, then we will um, um, you know be in a safer place. You know where where are we right now? <laughs> you know we're still virtual. Um, I'm hoping by the fall or the or December that we will be able to um, gather again um, to worship. But until then, um, I know God is a God of of, of of helping me understand. I know God is. He, he birthed scientists, so I trust what God has instilled into the scientists that would help me feel more faithful um, and believe that what we're going through is not going to last forever, that this is a season, and in this time, um, honor what the regulations have asked us to do, the CDC regulations have asked us to do. Um, we just have to, you know, be there for each other and be faithful with one another. Um, and I'm, I'm just grateful that, you know, no one in my family has been affected by COVID. I have not had COVID. Um, my members, a few of my members have had COVID-19, but um, even in that, they just knew what to do. We made sure that they had food and we, you know, I would drop, I dropped off boxes of food and just left it on their doorstep, didn't have interaction with them. Um, but these are the things as faith leaders, we are, our hands have been handcuffed. And so we've had to reimagine ministry so that we can still stay connected to them. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Reverend Hughes. I really appreciate the words you have to say. And I think that um, um, it's a really, really tricky situation that you're in right now in terms of um, most people, a lot of people turn to their faith in these really challenging times. And um, I'm Catholic and I remember the church closing down and I'm 49 years old and I don't remember ever a time not being able to go to church and not being able to even just sit in the church because my church closed too. And just, it was Easter and it was just watching church online. It was all just the strangest thing I had ever experienced. But, um, but I know that my priest was there and I know that you are there for your congregants and, and for you too, for all of us, I do hope that it will get better. If you could stay on for us, that would be great. um, Cause I know that we will have questions and our last speakers also, from the faith community um, in the Hartford area. Um, And so I would like to introduce the Reverend Dalen Greer, who is from the Bethel AME Church here in Bloomfield, very close to where I am right now. Um, Reverend Greer, uh, I'm hoping that you are still on. I can't see your screen. Let's 
see. I feel like he I'm might. I'm still on. Can you see me? Oh, yay. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> I can see myself. I'm in the top right corner. Let's see. I think you're. Oh, wait, wait. Here you are. Yay. I can see you, too. <laughs> <laughs> this is so Awesome. All right. Reverend Gray, it's nice to meet you. Um, and really if you could provide us with the same sort of information, and I know you have an extra tidbit because I know that you've been um, you've been affected by COVID. If you could share your experience, sure. if you're comfortable with that, that would be great. So uh, without further ado, uh, Reverend Gray. Certainly. Well, I want to say thank you, um, certainly to Tanya Hughes and um, to um, all of you for joining on this very important uh, webinar. And um, I'm Dalen Greer, the Reverend Dalen Greer. I'm the pastor of Bethel AME Church in Bloomfield, Connecticut, a colleague also of Reverend Orsella Hughes. Of, uh, and um, I'm the vice president of the Greater Hartford Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance. Um, I was affected with COVID-19 because uh, I had COVID. I um, received, I, I got COVID-19 um, over the Christmas holiday. And um, throughout the pandemic, uh, my church shut down and we had parking lot uh, worship services. First, we had a virtual worship service for um, about three months. And then we decided to have a parking lot service where people would stay in their cars and um, be able to come. And I would be outside on a platform outside and um, uh, we had music and, and that really kind of kept our people connected to faith. And it was a really wonderful experience in that parking lot. And we continued the parking lot all the way from May through December um, 31st. And it was really good. Everybody was uh, kept away from each other. Uh, I wore my mask. I was, uh, we sanitized everything. We even sanitized our church building. Um, and I had a lot of pressure from my congregation to go back into the sanctuary because we have a really large sanctuary. Our sanctuary is about, uh, seats about a thousand people. And so with the guidelines of the executive order, we thought, well, maybe we could do it, but we, uh, we still stayed away from that. We sanitized the building. And uh, around December, uh, I was, uh, as the vice president of the Ministerial Alliance, uh, we were uh, getting Christmas gifts ready for all of our pastors in our association. And I was the chairperson for that event. And I happened to have met with the president and it was our project. We, he and his family were safe. He and my family were safe. And because we were so close to each other, we thought that we were in our own safe bubble and that it would be okay. Um, needless to, to, to that, did I know that um, he went to a funeral. And at that funeral, um, he was exposed to COVID and his wife ended up uh, getting COVID and um, was quarantined. Well, being in that household, uh, he tested negative originally. And so we met, we worked on these ornaments. Uh, we, we did what we had to do. And um, lo and behold, about two days, about four days later, I started to feel not well and um, uh, went to the doctor immediately to get a COVID test. I went to one of the community health center drive-ins um, that Charter Oak had and um, uh, came back that my test was positive. I kind of figured my test was positive because I started to get the symptoms of not being able to smell. Um, I always could taste uh, and I just had severe body aches, a headache that lasted about two days. I don't think I had fever ever, but I probably did. The doctor said that I probably did. And they put me on a quarantine. And so over Christmas and over New Year's, I was quarantined in a room. Um, the rest of my family ran to get tested. And all of my, my two children and my wife tested negative. But I was quarantined for that 10 days in a bedroom. And my family had to take care of me. Uh, they brought me food and laid it outside of the door. And basically, I lived in a bedroom. 
um, for 10 days until I recovered. Even after the 10 days, it took me about uh, another two weeks to receive the sense of smell back again. And um, it, it was a very uh, trying experience. Uh, I, I was blessed that I didn't have a lot of upper respiratory issues. Um, felt a lot of pressure, but not necessarily the inability to breathe. And so, you know, I'm thankful to God for that. Uh, how my church was affected beyond me re having COVID and then stepping it up a notch in terms of our um, wearing of masks and sanitization of the church and being clean and social distance. Um, uh, we have, as Reverend Hugh said, in the Black church, a sick and shut in list. And um, I, we lost about, uh, we, we lost 27 members to COVID-19. Um, out of our church since um, March of last year. 27 members, I have performed 27 funerals of members of our church who had COVID-19. Uh, most of those members were senior persons. Uh, I would say 16 of them were in convalescent care and it seemed as though it just went through the convalescent home and it wasn't the same convalescent home. It was several different convalescent homes at different waves during the last 11 months. And so very recently, I just uh, performed three funerals for three members who all died from convalescent homes, but different convalescent homes. Um, some of the persons had other illnesses. Uh, well, most of them had other illnesses that affected uh, the, their uh, receiving COVID and then passing. And so uh, the, the history seemed as though uh, a person was ill, they were sick, they had other underlying conditions, and then they ended up with COVID-19. And, and within a two week period of time, uh, they had gone, um, they had passed away. And so uh, it was, it, it's been very difficult. In, in regards to uh, the homegoing celebrations, the funerals, has been very difficult because we've had to do graveside services. We haven't had service funerals in our church building. We've had funerals in the funeral home and wearing of a mask and only 10 people there and graveside services. We haven't been able to have those fellowship and repast that we normally have had. And even last night, I had to conduct a virtual funeral, the first one I've ever done, a virtual funeral where the family had the love, their loved one cremated and um, uh, the ashes were actually in that home of the loved one. I was at my church desk and all of the other members of the uh, tuned into Zoom and we had a Zoom funeral. And, um, and so it was very, very different, different and so how we minister to congregations now is different. We have to do things in a completely different way. Because of the, the cold weather, we are not able to be outside in that parking lot. And so we're uh, back to a virtual service and allowing up to 50 persons in our building. But again, our, our, our church sanctuary seats a thousand people. And so they are spread out so completely. And we have a praise team, musicians, myself and a few ministers are there. Um, and we are allowing our members to drive to the church to drop off their tithes and their offering. Um, they have to remain in the car um, or, they are or they're mailing it in or we're using online giving of Givelify and PayPal. And, and that has been something also very differ different in this time of technology where a lot of older persons uh, do not have the technology or have difficulty, even for me to get on this webinar, I had difficulty getting on and I'm 50 years old. Um, would I will I receive the vaccine? Absolutely. I recommend everyone or anyone to receive the va vaccination. Uh, and that's simply because I had COVID-19 and I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. Um, and just the illness of going through that it was nothing that I would want anyone to ever go through. And then to see loved ones and the number of funerals that I've had to perform um, and, and caring to congregations has been extremely um, difficult. We've also had to 
do everything remotely. Bible study is remote. We have a story time with the pastor where I try to interface with the young people. That has to be remote. So we use Zoom and we're Zoom savvy. Uh, our worship service is on Facebook and YouTube. And, and so that the, the blessing of that is that we are now uh, an international church because people are watching us from all over the world, not even the United States or the Northeast, but all over the world. We have persons that are watching us and we've even had members who've asked us, could they join our church from uh, South Carolina, Georgia, and in California? And so working out those details is, is different. And so where we are in the world is, uh, is a, new, um, a, a new place. We have to do ministry in a different way. Um, and we have to embrace change. Um, and I think that in some ways, COVID has been a blessing to us because it has forced us to change and get out of that box that we were in. Um, and I think that it has challenged the faith of our members because I have seen my congregation has become stronger and much more faithful. Um, I, I do want to say this, that also because of COVID-19, we have um, had to deal with um, some racial um, disharmony. Uh, because we were having a service outside in the parking lot, we had persons that spray painted the outside of our church and called us the N word and persons that sat in our parking lot. And while I was preaching, um, cursed at me and said all kinds of racial epitaphs out of their car window and then sp sped off. Um, and we are a suburban church. We are not necessarily in the heart of the inner city. And so when you when people see that you're doing something, and even if it's for good and for the community, um, there are some people that just don't like that. And so um, I, I would say that um, uh, our faith has been tested. My faith has been tested. We are a stronger congregation. We are stronger people. Uh, uh, I see the needs in, in my seniors of needing food and medicine and having to bring food boxes to them and just stay connected to all of our seniors. Uh, uh, lastly, one of the, the, the one of the greatest joys that I had was um, we did a car caravan uh, to the seniors of our congregation and just stood outside their door with balloons and with uh, little gifts. And um, I said a prayer to them with my mask on and we went from house to house um, and that was really a blessing to stay connected. They stayed in their house and we, I stayed outside. And, and so um, COVID has really been a, a challenge. Spiritually, it has been a blessing, um, but we certainly do look for the day when we can come back together as a community of faith, where we can see each other and be encouraged by our regular um, activities of worship. Uh, because it's so, so very important. And one of the things that I'm so very worried about is the connectiveness of our young people, because so many of our young people are not uh, as connected. If the parents are on YouTube, uh, I'm not so sure if the whole family is watching our worship service or what are the whole, what is the whole family doing? And so, you know, I really want to be able to touch our young people and pour back into them with those times of mentorship. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I can share about my COVID experience. Personally, um, I did uh, uh, increase my zinc and my um, echinacea, my vitamin D and my vitamin C, um, and plenty of fluids and water and rest, uh, rest, rest, rest. And that, that's really what, it, it, what I had to go through with COVID-19. But thank you very much for, part, for allowing me to participate in this webinar. Thank you so much, Reverend Greer. I really appreciate what you've said. I'm really horrified to hear what you've said about what's happened when you're outside and people are passing by. That is horrific. I don't even, I, I have no words for it, frankly. I can't even imagine how you have to get through a service with hearing that. Um, I, I just, I'm really sorry um, to hear that. And I, you have a lot of strength to keep on going and I'm glad you keep on, you have to keep on going, but I'm really sorry to hear that you've, had to deal with that because it's just, I don't get it. I don't really understand who's winning in that. Nobody's winning, but thank you for being here. You are our last speaker. Um, and we've now, um, we've got about uh, a half an hour-ish 
um, for questions. And so we can do questions in a few different ways. Um, uh, please, you could put them in the chat and the chat's up at top. It looks like uh, a little bubble chat and we have some questions there, which I will get to. You also can use the raise your hand feature. It looks like that. It's next to the chat feature. And um, if you'd like to raise your hand and ask a question of any of our panelists, then I will, um, um, Cheryl or I will look over there and you can unmute yourself and turn your camera on. Um, but now is your time to do that. I'm going to sc start scrolling through the questions in the chat, but please don't let that discourage you from putting more questions in the chat or raising your hand. Um, so the first question is, given that there's a degree of protection from just one dose of the vaccine, there has been discussion on shifting the vaccine strategy to giving more people one dose before giving fewer people two doses. Um, what are our thoughts on that strategy? And I would assume that would be for Dr. Lorenzen and Dr. Harp. Well, I, I, let me just say, I think that that would be a very, very bad move <laughs> for on, on a number of different levels. So we know that after the first vaccine, the level about 55 to 60 percent protection with one vaccine, that, and you get to the sort of the 95 percent level with a second. Um, but just think about a world in which you just give one vaccine. Um, your protection is only is in some mid-level extent. Um, the one thing we have is you know we, we have some we have some good confidence in the vaccine and its effectiveness. And if you had a number of people who have, who received the vaccine who are getting infected then obviously that would erode the confidence in the vaccine being as in terms of being something that's in fact effective. The second is that, you know, we're hoping at some point to get to this, this world of herd immunity. And the world of herd immunity is a world in which we've got to all get there together quickly. Uh, because, and so, because we actually don't know how long this vaccine is going to last. I mean, probably we think that a year, maybe in terms of the, the effectiveness, so we can get everybody, and so getting people in a situation in which they are um, in which they are uh, protected and getting a large, you know, getting this number protected is going to be there. Now, the Biden administration apparently just bought, I've heard, just bought 200 million vaccine doses. I mean, there's 300 million people here, but 200 million more vaccine doses. Um, I think that it, 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 looking at the end, at the beginning, um, <coughs> the issue probably will not be the access issue. <coughs> the issue will probably be more the fact that we've got to get people not to be hesitant about taking it because I think that we're now we've got CBS, Walmart, <coughs> Walgreens, all the W's <laughs> are, um, are, um, have the vaccine. And it's going to be it, by June or July, it's going to be everywhere. I mean, you'll be able to get it almost everywhere. So, you get the and get both doses. So, one, no, I think in terms of vaccine confidence, in terms of it working, we need to have both doses uh, done. Number two is the fact is, is that at the end of the beginning, it's going to be. The hesitancy in terms of people getting the vaccine is going to make the, it's going to make the difference in terms of that. And number three is that with this concept of herd immunity, getting people protected to a great extent um, is uh, it's so important. And I and I think that you know we, we won't get there if we've got half the people vaccinated, and half the you know people partially vaccinated basically, basically uh, but everyone partially vaccinated. We need numbers of people who are who are, uh, who are you know fully vaccinated in terms of the system. Okay, thank you. Dr. Harp, would you like to add to that? Um, you know, I think it's a really um, controversial area and and I, um, you know, I in many respects, I, I understand uh, what Dr. Lawrenson was saying. I have also read uh, so, some suggestions that it might be helpful. And I think, you know, if if I were just to to support the the perspective that um, the single dose would would be better, um, you know, I would say that um, while there is overall reduced um, efficacy in the sense that it that it might only confer a benefit of like fifty to sixty five percent or something like that. Um, you know, that is true for the flu vaccine, which we are currently using every year. Uh, so it's not 95% effective. Um, and, and so my sense is, is that, you know, I see both sides of the coin. Um, in, in many respects, I, I think that 
from a, a community mitigation perspective that that it might be reasonable actually to expand access and to give as many people as possible the one shot. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, the next question is, is there a higher incident of comorbidities? Uh, it, is there a higher incident of comorbidities that impact people of color? And would that prioritize those people in the next vaccine rollout? Well, that, yeah, that, I, mean, I, I can answer a couple. Of, but I, I don't, I don't want to leave the vaccine single the shot. Yes, with with you know, yes, with with the flu virus, the, you know, we we it, we don't cover a lot. You don't have a broad coverage in terms of. Uh, with the with the flu virus in terms of its effectiveness it's like 50 60 70 percent but you know in the case of our common flu virus vaccine we don't have a choice i mean if we had a choice and we had you know we and we had a two-shot flu vaccine that that had 95 percent coverage this would not be a debate we would be everybody would be all in to get a a, a, a two-shot the second is that this is not your father's Oldsmobile. And I guess I'm dating myself in saying that phrase because if people don't know what that phrase means, but this is not your father's Oldsmobile. If we think about COVID-19, you know, much, much highly, uh, much more highly infectious, longer incubation time, bigger amounts of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of death rate, you know, post COVID-19 things that we can't imagine in terms of what's going on and new, and, and new variants taking place in the same year. Uh, that are that are coming on. This is like this is this is a, a very different, uh, uh, very different beast that we were taking on in terms of in terms of that. And so I again I I would encourage in, you know that we make sure that we place all the pressure on the powers that be to make sure that our communities have the adequate vaccines and get have you know both doses of the vaccine uh, that are there. And the other point, of course, is the specter is that. We may have communities that get both vaccines, get both shots, um, and communities like you know the black communities, Latino communities that end up having uh, end up having a single shot, and so I don't want that to uh, take place in terms of our in terms of our communities. Um, and I'm sorry, give me the second question, please. Um, so, in terms of you know everything's been rolling out in in an order, um, and if there is a higher incident of comorbid comorbidities uh, in the community of color, should there be some priority uh, for the next vaccine rollout in terms of moving people up in line? Yeah, that, that question comes up a whole lot, and I, I think that you know, and there, there are a couple of things. One is that there there is a vulnerability index that is that uh, that you know, many communities use to look at how one can uh, should be allocating the um, allocating vaccines, and I think that vulnerability should be a factor. And the vulnerability meaning that, uh, but that that takes that has a lot of different factors to it. For instance, you, know, you if you have a a, a, uh, a place that's uh, in the suburbs to drive to to get a uh, to get a vaccine. Uh, well, you know, you may have your you have communities in which people don't drive, uh, and so uh, and so you know, placing uh, doing the right things by our community, such as placing uh, you know, vaccine centers in the community at a place that's easily accessible. Those are the things I think that that we should be doing. Those are the things we should be pushing for. Educating people, you know, uh, black and, and Latino people about um, about the COVID nineteen vaccine. Those are the things that we're that we're doing. The, the next level is whether we should allocate more to the black and Latino communities or versus not. I think that we need to do the basic, you know, um, football sports analogy, the basic block and tackling work, which is making sure that people who are very very smart, well, and you know, and uh, are uh, are uh, you know, when they have their opportunity to receive the vaccine, receive the vaccine, and number two, create the space and environment that vulnerable people can get the vaccine without uh, you know with, without uh, you know, without issue by placing in the communities, placing it near to where they are, and placing it in environments like a church, like mega churches, placing in environments in which people uh, go to uh, to be able to have the vaccines done. Those are the, I think the key. The key factors that that will make the difference in terms of uh, overwhelmingly make the difference uh, for the black community. 
Well, and I think that kind of leads into the next question. And, and Dr. Harp, if you'd like to um, answer th that question too, if you have something to add. I'm sure. I, I, I do think that there is a higher incidence of comorbidities that, that impact people of color, certainly diabetes, uh, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, obesity. Um, so I definitely think that they should be prioritized um, both from the standpoint of having these comorbidities and also being of racial and ethnic minorities um, that experience significant health inequities um, have access to the vaccine. Um, that being said, a group that is less talked about um, but often receive very um, have a severe response to the COVID infection are pregnant women. Um, and, and so I think that pregnant women should also be included. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. No, I think, and it was very interesting when you said that earlier in terms of not, of, of pregnant women not necessarily having COVID, but of the stress of living in this environment affecting their health and the health of their children is something that is, was, thought provoking and not something that people talk about and should really be talking about more. Um, the next question kind of morphs off of that. And I think, and I would like to hear from um, our speakers from the faith community too. And that is, you know, it's really for everybody, but what are the biggest barriers preventing um, the black and, and indigenous people community from getting vaccinated? And, and what do you hear in your communities about why people are not getting vaccinated and so there's an accessibility issue from just having the vaccine to get um, and having it in a location that is accessible for people to get to. But then there's also obviously the issue of people not just not having faith in the vaccine itself. And so I guess I'm wondering, it's kind of what are you hearing and what do you think can be done in order to um, in, in order to effectuate maybe some change in the people that you serve um, in getting this vaccine. Also, also um, Michelle, we should add the transportation issue because if you don't have the vaccine sites in the community, the, and then people can't get there. Um, uh, uh, Senator Hart talked about having to drive, um, you know, 30, 30 miles um, to, to, to get, get a, test. a test. And so right. I think that we can't uh, discount transportation as well. As no, that was all of it. Issue. Locations of clinics and hopefully, you know, getting to the W's, Walmart, you know, Walgreens, CVS. But but if you that's fine if you live in the cities, but there are remote locations where people of color live. I'm thinking about where um, my boss lives out in Willimantic in that eastern Connecticut, where there are people, um, Hispanic people who live out in, in eastern Connecticut that it's very difficult to maneuver out there if you don't have a car. So anyway, I'm digressing, but if you can speak to um, what I said earlier, that would be great. I, I was going to lead with the transportation piece. Um, that That is one of the um, um, resistance, but I personally have not heard, at least from my congregation, about anyone resisting to receive the vaccination. Um, we, like I said, in Danbury, it hit and it hit hard. And so people saw the impact. Um, it went through some of our members. We didn't lose anyone, but they're not resistant to the vaccine. They actually, um, uh, with the exception of, you know, the next phase of age group, um, my members um, have already started the vaccination process. So that that's my, that's how it is in my church. Which is great because I think those, you know, for those who have already been vaccinated, I have, um, like my parents were vaccinated a couple of weeks ago. And I think, you know, when they tell their stories to other folks about how they also felt after too, because I think that's been a big hesitation too, is there's been a lot of discussion of how you'll feel and, you know, who wants to voluntarily go in and, and get something that's going to make you sick. There's not that many people. I mean, granted, there's a massive upside to it, but I think telling those stories will probably help too, but that's good to hear. Reverend Greer. Yes. Um, what I would say is um, having more than one uh, vaccination site in the town or the city uh, would help our congregation. Uh, I've been getting a lot of calls from my members asking, can we have a vaccination clinic at our local church? 
And so trying to work with the mayor and the health commissions and um, uh, those powers that be to have that in our um, church, uh, it has been, I'm finding, a difficult process. And uh, we're meeting with other faith leaders of different churches, uh, of white and black, uh, trying to make sure that the message gets sent out across our congregations uh, to feel comfortable receiving the vaccination. And um, how do you combat that fear? And one of the ways of combating that fear is to, uh, is to have the vaccination clinic at the, the local assembly where people feel comfortable, where they go to worship. And um, the, the thought also is to even lessen that fear um, is that if, if I, as a leader of faith, I go to um, another church that's not my church and I get my vaccination over there and I can say to the community, I received my vaccination over there and that pastor come to my church and he or she received their vaccination at my church. And that way, if we had multiple uh, sites where it's not just, okay, we're, we're going to take the, um, the the largest church in this town or the largest church in the city and all of our vaccinations will go there, uh, but have multiple at one time, I think that would really um, uh, open up the sense of safety and people would feel good about going and having the vaccination. We know you after the second dose, people are saying that they're having a little aches and pains and a few days of body issues. But um, I think that if we had more than one site and if the sites were at the churches, the communities of faith, um, I think that would be what where we need to go. I think that's a great idea. Um, Definitely, and really great, really great insight. Before we, you go on to the, to the next question, Michelle, I just had a question for uh, former Senator Hart because she talked about the, uh, going to get um, the vaccination at the Hill Health Center and the uh, demographics being very different. And I just wanted to know, was it, did you get a sense that um, there were uh, people of color in the community who would have gotten um, uh, tested or vaccinated, but their spots were taken by um, white people who came into their community and were not from New Haven? Or uh, was it that there were so many spaces available and, and they could not find enough people from the community who wanted to either you know, be tested or have the vaccination? Which, which thing do you think it was? Well, you know, I think that it was probably a combination in many respects. I know that at the Hill Health Center, they were making calls to all of the uh, elderly um, uh, patients that they had. But you know, one of the things, and you have to be a politician to appreciate this when you're trying to make calls throughout a community, and then you discover that the phone numbers that you have are no good. Yeah. Uh, people in, um, in poor communities, oftentimes when they can't afford to pay the phone bill, then they will drop that line and go to another service. And so oftentimes you, you, you don't really have a good way of, of uh, contacting folks. And I know at the Hill, they were calling people. And so I think that, that all of the typical ways that middle-class people, whether they be black or, or white, think about access has really got to be based not upon how they access systems, but upon how people access systems that don't have resources. And so um, I would say that it was more of a resource issue. And then you've got to remember that these clinics have a certain amount of time in which they have to actually uh, use the vaccine or it's, it's, it's unviable. So, um, so I think that those were all of the kinds of things that were working that, you know, it's hard to contact people. And I wanted to, to go back to the churches. One of, I'm working with an organization that is trying to build health ministries within churches and trying to make sure that there's someone in almost every church or to the degree that we can get to churches who can advocate on behalf of the members of those churches and 
uh, be a referral source if you can't get the vaccines actually in your churches. In, in New Haven, our health department has actually started not working with churches, but they're going to senior buildings and providing vaccinations on site for people who want them in our senior housing uh, uh, projects. So that's uh, another thing that can work. But you know, I, I guess what I wanna say is if you wanna get certain populations, you can't do it the way that you would get a high functioning middle-class population to the table. You, you will have people who are, are not that, who would like it, but just can't get in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's gonna be a, 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 a challenge that's going to have to be met because as Dr. Lorenzen said, if this vaccine only lasts a year or we're going to continue to be vaccinated, um, this is not going to go away. And it's not like the flu where everybody knows, well, not everybody, but you know you have to be vaccinated at a certain time and you have to worry about winter, this is something you're going to have to worry about all the time. And so these questions are going to have to be answered and they're going to have to be answered quickly um, so that the vulnerable populations who are continuing to suffer in all aspects um, don't continue. But thank you for those, those very thoughtful words. Um, we have another question in the chat. It says, is there guided literature available for non-medical community leaders to use to help educate members of the black and brown communities relative to the need for receiving the vaccine. So, um, Dr. Lorenzen. Yeah, a couple of things. Actually, first of all, I just wanted to uh, make a, send a special um, shout out to the Honorable uh, Tony Harp. Uh, you know, when we started the our institute, uh, 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 Senator Harp then was you know very instrumental in our receiving funding from the state for our programs and the reason why we're able to do the work that we're doing right now in terms of health disparities in terms of our journal in terms of writing the first paper in terms of the research that we've done is really largely due to uh, Senator Harp and her work in terms of supporting our institute and so and, and she does this all the time and across you know the state and the country and you know and is you know sort of unsung for it but I am I am so grateful for um, all the work that she's done in terms of the state, but, all, but especially in terms of our institute. So to have a public opportunity to be able to thank her is something that uh, is, is really great. So um, thank you. Thank you, Senator Harp. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Lawrence. And, and I just want to say that we are so blessed to have you in Connecticut. So thank you. <laughs> But the uh, so in terms of you know in terms of uh, something on you know public that that's there and I can I'll leave the link for it. Um, uh, this roundtable group on black men and black women in science engineering and medicine got together and said what do we need to do, and we said Listen, we need to do a video on in layman's terms about what the key questions are, and so uh, the video that we have uh, actually is a uh, starts with my video. Uh, in terms of uh, the experience, which is in layman's terms about what's going on with me, how I'm feeling. But then it, we have these questions and it's, it was, we actually pulled the round table and said, give us the 25 questions that your neighbors are asking, your patients are asking, the person next door is asking, you know, you, know, you get in the Uber, and wait a minute, you're a doctor, let me give you this, this, let me ask you this question. What are those questions and what are the answers? I'll give the link afterwards, it's on the National Academy of Sciences link, uh, link. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's plain truth answering questions and feel free to utilize that and distribute that to uh, to others. We, we're now partnering and talking to Facebook about putting it on their Black Voices uh, page and their COVID-19 page that they have uh, that they have. And, and we're you know, partnering with another group that's actually on YouTube right now in terms of the uh, video, but the link is there. And, and I think that may be helpful in terms of providing that information for people to be able to, 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 to see. It's, it's short, it's about 45 minutes, um, and it uh, provides a lot of the answers. And any links, thank you. Any links that are provided, any and all the information that uh, was given today will be on um, our website, which I put into the chat at the beginning of the training. So if you go to our website, www.ct.gov slash chro, there's a COVID-19 tab, and we will um, include the link there uh, so that you can use that in terms of educating um, the public that you are serving. 
Uh, I do not see any more questions in the chat and I do not see any hand raised. Cheryl Sharp, do you have any more questions? No, and uh, we are actually right on schedule and uh, want to thank so much um, all of the participants here today, all of the panelists, and thank our guests uh, for um, asking questions. This has been a, an extremely important conversation, uh, very insightful. I'm sad to see that our webinar series um, on COVID-19 and uh, the healthcare system and where you live is coming to an end. I think that all of the, uh, the webinars have been uh, very informative. Um, and today I'm really walking away with uh, some gems uh, in terms of information that can be shared with our stakeholders. Um, and I'm happy that uh, we have the COVID-19 tab where we can add any links or any information um, that any of our speakers have that can be shared with um, our stakeholders from across the state of Connecticut. Um, I'd like to thank our executive director who has another event. Um, she's um, doing a presentation for young people um, at 12 o'clock. So uh, she will be starting that in one minute. Um, it's a very busy time at the CHRO and we thank uh, each and every one of you because we know you are busy as well uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much, everybody.